Our scripture reading this morning will be from Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. For we, are, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness of our God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of our deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Good morning. There's nothing like a little spring weather, is there? That's nothing like it out there either. It's, but aren't you glad to be in here where it's nice and warm, it's comfortable, it's wonderful. So glad to be here with the family of God. And if you're not yet part of the family of God, this family wants you to be part of this family. We want you to become part of God's family, part of his kingdom. So if there's any thought in your heart, inclined in that direction, and you have any questions for us, don't hesitate to ask before you leave this place today. We want to talk to you about being part of not just this congregation, but a part of the, the kingdom of God as he established it all the way back about 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost. This morning we're talking about something else that took place on Pentecost, and that's Peter's preaching of Jesus, where he promised not only through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection the forgiveness of sins, but the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the indwelling, as it's called, of the Holy Spirit of God, or the, or the Spirit of God living in us. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 1. So if you've got your New Testaments, go to Matthew chapter 1. We'll look at a passage here in just a moment to kind of introduce us to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's tendency towards life in everything it does. But first of all, I want you to consider this, that you and I each have spirits. How much do we know about those spirits? Well, I don't know about you, but I don't know much about my spirit. I, I don't know how it lives in me. I don't really understand that. Now, as far as my bodily organs, I, I know I've got kidneys, or at least I, I think I do, uh, most human bodies have those. I've never actually seen them, but I think they're there because they seem to be working all right. And it's usually when things go wrong that we find out we, got, we actually have those organs that are just not working right. Isn't that the way it works? Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure I've got a heart. Uh, I haven't seen it either, but I have some uh, conception of, of how it works, how it pumps blood. Now, you know where this is going, don't you? I think I've got a brain. But I haven't seen that. But when we think about these things, and well, I haven't seen that guy's kidneys, I haven't seen his heart, I haven't seen his brain, hopefully there's some evidence that all those things are actually there, and we understand that they are there. I've got a spirit. James, uh, when, when he wrote his brief five-chapter letter, we just studied that last quarter in, in a couple of different classes, James said in chapter 2, as the body without the spirit is dead... So faith without works is dead. So he was talking about faith and works, but in teaching us about faith and works, he taught us something about the relationship between the body and the spirit. When our spirit leaves our body, our body then becomes dead. Do you remember the second chapter of Genesis? God formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. So there was a, a physical human body there in some fashion, and what did God do? He breathed into its nostrils, and that breath from God became a living soul in Adam. And so each of us, in one sense or another, have, have uh, had God breathe into us a soul, a spirit. 
a part of us that we cannot see but that we, we know exists. And for all we do not understand about it and cannot perhaps understand about it, there are some things that we can understand and, and that's what we're, we've been trying to understand during this course of study. Matthew chapter 1 is where I've asked you to go. Look down at verse 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. How'd that work? I don't have a clue. But I know that it did. I understand that God sent his spirit to Mary, and because of that spirit working somehow within Mary's body, Mary conceived a child, and that child was Jesus. And because it was of God's spirit, as well as Mary's body, it was both divine and human. 100% God, 100% human. No other person in the universe has ever had that distinction, but that is Jesus Christ. And that life conceived in her was of the Holy Spirit. Everywhere the Spirit goes, everything the Spirit touches tends towards life. And so the idea that God would put His Spirit in you and put His Spirit in me is, well, it's unbelievable. This is the best news that mankind could have. Of course, we understand the good news of having our sins forgiven, but, but that's what allows God to approach us. Do you remember when Isaiah came into the throne room of God in Isaiah chapter 6? I don't know if you've read this or not, but what did Isaiah say when he found himself in the presence of God? He said, woe unto me, because I am a man of unclean lips. Anybody else in here, man of unclean lips or a woman of unclean lips? You ever said anything you regret? I, I, I stopped doing that long ago. Right. And, and not only did, I think that was an unclean lie right there. He said, not only am I a man of unclean lips, but I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And God sent one of his angels, and the angels took a coal, a burning coal from off the altar that was in front of God and touched Isaiah's lips with that coal. And it didn't hurt Isaiah, didn't seem to, didn't burn him. But what it did, it cleansed him of his sin. And because his sin was cleansed, he was able to stand before God and ready to stand before God. When God said, I need a man to sin, what did Isaiah say? He said, here am I, send me. That's the kind of work that God does. And so when he sends his spirit, it's a spirit that brings forth life within and it creates in us a greater part of the divinity. As Peter said, through the word of God, which was delivered by the Spirit of God, we take on the divine nature. And that's what we are doing all the time as the Spirit lives in us and influences us. Now that's from Matthew 1.18. I want you to go down to John chapter 3, talking about the Spirit living in us. We've seen how God sent His Spirit to bring forth the child Christ within Mary. Now in John chapter 3, there is a man who comes to this God child, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, and he says to him in verse 2, Rabbi, teacher, we know you've come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I've wondered, what in the world, what kind of a response is that? Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, We know you're from God. And Jesus doesn't say, well, I'm so glad you've recognized this. This is wonderful. You've got a very insightful mind. Doesn't say anything like that. Doesn't say, hello, good morning. How are you? How's your family? What's going on? Nicodemus says that to Jesus. And Jesus says, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Where's that come from? If you back up to chapter 1, just for a second here, and look at verse 12. John the Apostle, writing this gospel, says to us in John chapter 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So what do you get when you believe in Jesus? You get the right to become a child of God. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and he expresses faith. I believe you're from God. And so Jesus just cuts to the chase. Well then. If you believe in me, you've got the right to become a child of God. Let me tell you how that's done. Let me tell you how to become a child of God. How do you do that? Born again. Born again. Nicodemus had some questions. Look at verse 4. 
Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? He can't enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Seems like a legitimate question for the idea of being born again, being put to him. Jesus says to him in verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, and do you see it there? Are you reading? What's the next thing? The Spirit. You've got to be born, Jesus says, of water and the Spirit. And unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I believe he's talking about baptism here. One of the reasons I believe it is because you drop down to verse 22, and what is Jesus doing out in the countryside? He's baptizing people. You get to chapter 4, just a few verses down from right where we are here, and they're baptizing so many people, more people than John the Baptist baptized. Why was John called John the Baptist? Because he baptized people. He baptized so many people that people called him the baptizer. And here are Jesus and his apostles baptizing more people than John the Baptist baptized. wonder why that is. Do you think that has anything to do with God giving his spirit, with God introducing his kingdom, with God enlarging his family by teaching people how to be born into the family of God? I think that might have just a little bit to do with it. Now, as far as that birth is concerned, it's by water and the spirit. We can see the water. We get people to water. If I were to ask for a show of hands, probably most everybody in here would raise their hand, yes, we have been to the water, been in the water, we've been baptized into Christ. But with all the baptisms I've been involved in, all the baptisms I've witnessed, I've never seen, physically seen, the Spirit of God. That's because God's Spirit is not physical. It's, it is a spirit. And as Jesus said, a spirit does not have flesh and bones. We know that there are such things as spirits. We know we each have one, but we've never seen it because, well, it's not physical. It can't be observed with the senses. But do you have faith, as I have faith, that when someone believes in Jesus Christ and is baptized in water, that God sends his spirit at that point? That's what he's saying he does. That's what I believe happened with each one of us. That's what I believe Jesus is teaching here. From this point, let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, Jesus has told Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you're not coming into the kingdom unless you're born of water and the Spirit. That's the only way to get into the kingdom. Well, in Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And he begins in verse 22 to preach about Jesus. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. This man, delivered by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And then Peter goes on to quote several passages from the old text that these Jewish folks would have known very well. So imagine what's going on. You're, you're just some Jewish fellow. You've shown up at Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And this guy starts preaching to you about this Jesus. And you've heard about this Jesus because you know this was big news. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher. Nobody could teach like he taught. That's what everybody said. Nobody teaches like him. He teaches with authority, not like the scribes and Pharisees. Well, who were the scribes and Pharisees? Well, they were the best teachers they had. But Jesus outstripped him in their teaching. Jesus was the one that you knew people had said he could heal any disease there was. People came to him with messed up arms and legs, and he healed. He fixed their legs. He gave sight to the blind. He gave hearing to the, to the ones who could not hear. He even raised a man from the dead. What did they do with him? Well, they killed him. They killed him? Was he just a teacher? Well, no. Some said he was the Messiah. Some said he was the one that God had sent to save Israel. And they killed this guy? Well, yeah. That's what Peter's telling us about. Peter goes on to preach about the resurrection. And he concludes this in verse 36. It's a brief but a very powerful sermon. Peter says, Let all the house of Israel know, therefore, for certain that God has 
made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Verse 37 says, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? By the way, do you think these guys believed what Peter said? I, I think they did. I think that's why they asked the question. That's why Luke could say to us, could write this for us. They were pierced to the heart. Well, if they believe in Jesus, according to John 1, 12, remember what we read a while ago? What do they have now? They've got the right to become children of God. How are they going to become children of God? They've asked the question, what are we going to do now that we've killed the Son of God? And Peter said to them in verse 38, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Guess who that is? That's us. Because he wasn't just talking about far off geographically. He's talking about far off geographically and far off in time. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ to reach down until the day that Jesus will return and bring time to an end and usher us into eternity. We are those who are far off. We are those for whom this promise also exists not only the forgiveness of sins, but that God would put his spirit in us and that we would become temples of God's Holy Spirit. That's what Peter's preaching here in Acts chapter 2. If you look at Acts chapter 5, this question comes up again. Acts chapter 5, Peter and the apostles have been commanded, stop preaching this Jesus, stop teaching the gospel because you're upsetting everybody. And so they said in verse 29... We must obey God rather than men. This is Acts chapter 5 and verse 29. We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And then Peter says, Peter says, we are his witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Who does God give his spirit to? Those who obey him. What did that mean in chapter 2? Well, it meant those who would repent of their sin and let someone baptize them in water for the remission of their sin. Also that they would receive the Holy Spirit. You see the connection? God puts his spirit in us when we become obedient to his son's gospel. There is no other teaching on the planet more important, more vital to your eternal salvation than this teaching right here. Nothing else. I'll tell you what, I'd like to get on the computer and, and find things out. You can learn a lot of stuff on the computer. Amen? And not all of it's good. Yeah, I know I'd get an amen with that one. When I work on my car, one of the first places I go is YouTube because I know somebody's tried to do to my car or to a car like mine what I'm going to try to do to it. So I, and I've found some very helpful stuff on YouTube. When I want to learn skills, how to do things outdoors, like how to make a fire without matches or without uh, a lighter, how to make a fire maybe with a piece of steel and a piece of flint or with, actually, you know this thing about rubbing sticks together? In principle, that really works. You need to know a few things about how to, but it all works. And it's fascinating because you can get on YouTube and you can find out guys that know this stuff and they can teach you these things and you can learn it all. You want to know how to make something to eat? Anything you want to fix, dessert, main dishes, side dishes, snacks, it's all on YouTube. Ain't that wonderful? And all you ladies are thinking, tell them about Pinterest, Marty. Tell them about Pinterest. <laughs> I don't know much about Pinterest except all the things, all the pictures I see from Pinterest make me lust because it's desserts and stuff like that. All that information in the world, you could memorize it, you could practice it, you could do it all, but if you don't have the gospel of Christ, you're lost. The only thing on YouTube that'll save you is this teaching right here. It's there, you might have to look for it, but it's there. The only thing in the world, the only thing in the universe that'll save you is this teaching right here. And it's this teaching that's so central, so focal to our soul salvation that is the same teaching that tells us 
When this happens, God puts his spirit in you. What does God's spirit tend to do? It tends to bring life. And so when he puts his spirit in you, it gives you life. If you'll keep going to the right in your New Testament, over to the 8th chapter of Romans. Romans chapter 8. We were here last week. Dwayne uh, used this passage to talk to us about the Lord's Supper, to introduce it to us. Romans 8 chapter 1. Uh, eight, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Get it out of there. You didn't know I could do that, did you? If you missed it. Okay. And everybody's thinking, now pop goes the weasel. No, it's just Marty. Look at this. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, how do you get into Christ Jesus? Well, you're baptized into Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life. Do you get that? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Amen. The law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. What's the law of sin and death? You sin you die. We are free from that through Jesus Christ. Thank God. But drop down to verse 9. I don't mean to skip the things between 2 and 9 because they're unimportant. We did deal with these things to some extent about five sermons ago. But I want to make a point here from, from verse 9 and following. Where Paul says, however, you are not in the flesh but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now what he's doing, he's using the spirit of God or the idea of the Holy Spirit interchangeably with the spirit of Christ. Because you can't really separate them out. If you've got the Holy Spirit of God in you, you've also got Christ in you. And you've got God the Father in you. But this idea of the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in us is what he's focusing on here. Verse 10. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Amen. Now, the question might be for some of us, when will he give life to our mortal bodies? Now? Yes. I believe so. As a matter of fact, we're studying Proverbs and Ecclesiastes uh, on Sunday mornings and, and Wednesday nights. Ecclesiastes on Wednesday night and Proverbs on Sunday morning. One of the things that we'll read through in Proverbs is that if you, if you listen to the word of the Lord and you apply the word of the Lord to your life, it is going to be health to your body. That's the way it works. By the way, where did the... Where did the word come from? Was it not inspired of God and delivered to men through his Holy Spirit? That was a lesson a couple weeks ago, wasn't it? Yeah, that's how that works. Everywhere the Spirit goes, life goes. You study the word of God, it's going to tend towards life. You obey the gospel and God puts his Spirit in you, it's going to tend towards life. Here as well as in eternity. What's going to happen to our mortal bodies? They will die. Eventually, they will die. And they will go back to the dust of the earth. But what God promises through Jesus' resurrection and through the Spirit is that he will resurrect our mortal bodies. That's why Paul, when he wrote to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, he talked about these bodies as being seed. And he said, don't you know that when you take a seed and you plant it in the ground, what is your intent? You intend from that seed to have a plant to come up for that plant to mature and to bear fruit. But is the plant like the seed? No, the seed's just a little black, ugly, brown, gray, whatever color it is thing. You put that in the ground and that seed does what? It dies. The seed dies and in the death of that seed, life comes forth. And that's how Paul likens the, the planting of a seed and the growing of a plant to the resurrection. And He's writing here in Romans 8 to say to us that if the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, God's Holy Spirit is in you, your bodies may die, but they will be resurrected. Life, life here and life in eternity. What did Jesus say? I came that they might have life. And have it how? More abundantly. Not just to exist, 
Not just to be biologically alive, but to be fervently alive with a living hope because of Jesus Christ and his resurrection and the Spirit of God that lives in us. Let's keep going with this. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Corinth was a very sensual place. As a matter of fact, some of the pagan, heathen, idolatrous religions that were practiced there were based on sensuality and prostitutes. So in that context, Paul writes this to the church at Corinth. Look at verse 15. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? Therefore, you've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Where is God's spirit? In you, Paul writes to the church at Corinth. Every saint has God's Spirit living in him. That's in fact what makes us a saint, a sanctified one, a set-apart one. And Paul was writing to them saying, don't be messing around sensually. Don't be committing fornication. You keep yourself pure because your body is a temple. And who's living in that temple? The Holy Spirit of God is living in that temple. You treat that body with the respect that a temple of God deserves is what Paul is saying here to the church at Corinth. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. We'll go here and we'll wrap this lesson up. And some of you are saying, wait a minute, Marty, there's a whole lot of other passages about the Holy Spirit. Yes, there are. Yes, there are. We don't have time in this lesson. As a matter of fact, I don't know that we could come up with a series in which there'd be enough time to touch on them all. That's why I do so encourage you to study on your own. Please don't rely on what you hear here alone to strengthen you spiritually. If we said we're going to have a potluck meal, would you come to the potluck meal and enjoy that potluck meal and say, oh, great, I won't need to eat a thing until I come back next week? Who would say that? Only a crazy man. As a matter of fact, you're probably going to go home, and what's the first place you're going to go when you get home? If you're like other people I know, you go to the kitchen. You don't even have to be hungry. You just like it. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful if that's the same attitude and spirit we had towards the Word of God? It doesn't even have to be time to study. We just like to study. Let's get that book cracked open again. Ephesians chapter 1. <coughs> yes, excuse me. In this first chapter of Ephesians, Paul is talking about so many wonderful things that are in Christ. And he says this down in verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who's given us a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. You know how many sermons are just in those two brief verses? In Christ, after listening to the message of the truth, that's what Peter preached on Pentecost. That's one of the passages we used to start this lesson. Preached that message of truth. People responded to it. They believed it. They responded to it. And they were sealed with what? with the Holy Spirit, but he didn't just call it a Holy Spirit here, it's the Holy Spirit of promise, because it's connected to God's promise, promise to forgive us of sin, promise to bring us into eternal life, promise to make us part of his family. All the promises of God are wrapped up in that Holy Spirit of God that he gives to us. And it says we are sealed in him. How important is a seal? 
You might be thinking of different kinds of seals. One of the things this made me think about, when I was in the military, I was a weapons troop, and one of the things we had to train to do, fortunately, we never had to actually do it, but we had to train to load nuclear bombs on fighter bombers. And one of the things that a fighter bomber has to have to carry a nuclear weapon is a cockpit that'll hold two men because you cannot release a nuclear bomb by yourself. There's got to be at least two of you, and actually there's got to be more than two because the pilot has to be getting codes that are sent to him from a radio operator miles away, hopefully miles away if we're talking nuclear weapons. But at any rate, it's, it's a long, drawn-out, complicated process. You can't just fly up and drop a nuclear bomb uh, any way, shape, or form. And one of the things that we had to do was climb up in the cockpit, and certain switches that were going to be used had to be put in a particular position and then wired in that position with copper wire. And that wire had to have a lead seal put on it. And then we had to have a crimping tool with a particular kind of crimp that would seal that lead over that wire so that anybody who knew what they were doing could look at it and say, that, that switch is sealed. Now that wire was designed to be broken, but if you looked at it and it was already broken what it wasn't supposed to be, you knew that security had been breached. This is what we're talking about, security. Dealing with nuclear weapons, you want everything to be secure. You want everything to be right. And what God says about his Holy Spirit is he has sealed us with his Holy Spirit. When God puts his spirit in us, it's a done deal. You're sealed. You belong to him now. You're mine, God says. I put my spirit in you. Nobody else can have you. You're mine now. You're mine into eternity. That's the way it works with God. And so Paul, as he writes this letter to the church at Ephesus, and remember what it was like to be in Ephesus. This is the place where for two hours in the stadium, the population of that city had gathered, and for two hours they cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! Great is Diana of the Ephesians! Great is this goddess that doesn't even exist of the Ephesians. So you, you can see, you can get the idea how the, the pressure of that society might have borne down on these people so that they might stop believing. But Peter writes and he says, don't worry about that. God has given you his Holy Spirit and with that spirit you have been sealed. And with that spirit with which you were sealed, those promises were sealed for you as well. Look what else he says in verse 14. This spirit is given as a pledge of our inheritance. What's, a, what's that mean? You want to buy a car, but you're not going to pay for it today. You're going to come and talk to the guy who has it. You might bring a couple hundred dollars, and you're going to put that money down. What's that money down for? That's to prove to that guy that you're serious about buying the car. And you're telling him, I'm going to buy it. I'm so sure I'm going to buy it that if I don't come back and buy it, you can have that $200 or $500 or however much it is. It's a signal. It's a sign that you're earnest about this. You really mean it. And so Paul writes and he says, God is so serious about saving us, he puts his spirit in us, and that spirit is a pledge that he's going to save us. With a view to the redemption of God's own possession. Now stop and think about it. <coughs> what possession does he have in view? You. Me. We are the possession he wants to redeem. And so he puts his spirit in us, his spirit of promise, his Holy Spirit of promise that seals us his, and he says this is a, uh, a down payment, so to speak, we might say today, and it's with a view towards redeeming you when I come back. And when Jesus comes back, that's when we will know, brothers and sisters, that's when we will fully understand just how important it will be to have God's spirit in us. What will happen to those who do not have God's Spirit? It'll be a sad day. It'll be a sad eternal day. But nobody has to face God without the Spirit. God offers His Spirit freely to all. All you have to do is put your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. All you have to do after that is repent of your sin. Let someone baptize you in water for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of of the Holy Ghost and that gift that Holy Ghost coming to you will seal you his isn't that great news it's so simple man I'm glad we don't have to bring in animals and kill them anymore 
I don't know how much I would feel forgiven just because I killed some animal. I've killed a few animals. It generally tends to make me feel a little more guilty, perhaps. But Jesus' blood, you talk about clean. You talk about at peace. That's what it's all about. We're going to stand and sing a song of encouragement and invitation. If you've never allowed someone to baptize you into Christ for the remission of your sin, then you've never yet received the Holy Spirit of God. If you don't have the Holy Spirit of God, you're not sealed as God's. You have no hope of receiving those promises. Would you like to change that today? We're hoping you will. If you'd like to, just let us know by coming forward while we stand and sing this song together.